Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Jesus Doctrine as I do part six of our series of the book of Ezekiel. We want to continue with chapter eight, but before we get there, just a quick recap. In the last episode, we so spoke about how angry God was with Israel and Judah for being unfaithful to him. And we spoke about how bad the judgment God would bring against them is. In this chapter, God's taken Ezekiel and he's showing him what's going on across the land of Israel in the temple and across Jerusalem. The first place that Ezekiel is taken to, and I believe he's taken there or given a vision or taken there in the spirit, but Ezekiel is taken from where he is in Babylon and shown what's going on in Israel. The first place they go to is in the temple and he sees there were images and there were icons and foreign gods established and foreign altars. Um, these are described as there to provoke jealousy from the Lord. And so we can already see a conflict coming on. God can see a rival, although there is no rival to God. But these foreign gods and imagery and icons that are being worshipped are being presented across the land of Israel. God is not happy. As we go a little bit further into the book, the Bible starts to speak about the ancients, the elders of Israel, those in a leadership position in Israel. And it speaks about them doing things in secret places, behind closed doors, behind a wall. And God's just taking Ezekiel in deeper and deeper and showing him the things that are happening in secret, where there are all sorts of images of animals that people are worshiping and bowing down to in the secret place even the religious leaders and the elders of Israel. Then Ezekiel's taken to outside the temple. And when he gets outside the temple, he's met by a woman that's weeping. Now, you and I probably don't understand the significance of this, but a woman weeping outside of a temple to who? Why is she weeping? Well, the Bible says that she's weeping to this name. It's the name of a false demigod. And she's there weeping and crying to it. And this is actually part of a, a religious ritual that is going on to a foreign God, to this demigod that spends half of its time living on the earth and half of its time living in the underworld. And here she is weeping and crying, partaking in a religious ritual to another God right outside the foot of the temple. But then it gets even worse. Ezekiel's taken a little bit further. Between the porch and the altar of the temple, there's around 25 men, all facing with their backs towards the altars of God, and they're facing towards the sun, and they're beginning to worship the sun. Even within the very temple itself, we see all sorts of people from different ages, different statuses, different backgrounds and places of influence, all worshiping foreign gods right there in the presence in the house of God himself. God is furious. And I'm sure this is part of the reason that God's anger in the last chapters was as great as it is. So as chapter nine begins, God is exceedingly angry. And I'm just gonna read for you the very first verse of chapter nine, which speaks about God calling out for those to come and judge and to do his work to destroy those that have gone and worshiped foreign gods. And it reads, Then he cried in my ears with a loud voice saying, Bring near the executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces the north, each with his weapon of slaughter in his hand, and with them a man clothed with linen, with a writing case at his waist, and they went and stood beside the bronze altar. God is the one that initiated the judgment of this city, that initiated the besieging of the city, that initiated the famine and the pestilence, that initiated the fire that fell in the midst of the city. This was always the work of God because of the acts that Jerusalem and Israel had committed themselves to with their idolatry and cheating on God. It's interesting though that a man in linen 
with an ink horn comes out. This man is given a job in this chapter to go around and to find those that have sighed, find those that were angry, find those that were hurting about the detestable practices of worshipping foreign gods. And if there were people there that were grieved by the acts that others had done and worshipped foreign gods, then he would mark them on their foreheads. This is the mark of God. And the executioners would be then sent out to kill anybody that didn't grieve and that didn't have the mark of God on their forehead. And everybody, man, woman and child, they would all be killed if they didn't have the mark of God on them. Now, the reason this interests me is because it gives us the criteria of how to be marked for God. And it wasn't enough to believe in God or to worship God. Actually, in this passage, it clearly states that those that were marked were those that would sigh, those that would mourn, those that were heartbroken about people's unfaithfulness to the true God of Israel. Let's have a read of that passage. And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. If we're not grieved for the things that grieve God, there's every possibility, according to this passage, that you might not be marked with the mark of God and saved from the coming judgment to come in the time of the wrath of God being poured out. It's interesting that these men aren't taken out of Jerusalem. They're not saved from the hardship that comes being associated with the city or even with Israel, but they are saved from being killed by the sword or being struck by a pestilence in the passage being spoken of here. Ezekiel did try to intercede for Israel. And he said, are you gonna destroy them all for the sake of the sins here? And God's like, yeah, I am, and I'm gonna spare none. And God's pretty relentless and pretty firm on his utter destruction that he's called upon the children of Israel that have given themselves over to these practices. I know that a lot of times that we believe in intercession and praying to intercede for people, but there will be a time where our intercession will not stop the judgment of God falling down. And so the best thing that you and I can do is to prepare people to turn away from their idols, to worship the true God and to love God and to be hurt by the things that hurt God so that we do not get caught up in the wrath of God that will be poured out in the future. So now as we come to chapter 10, we find another very interesting picture. In chapter 10, we see from the heavens, the throne of God and his cherubim and his angels reappearing. We see the sapphire, we see the blue colors, which symbolize his royalty around his throne. We see some of the other precious colors and stones that were there. If you didn't already watch the video all about what's going on in the imagery of the angels and the throne of God, please do watch these two videos. One is a brief introduction that everyone's gonna need to see. And the other is an in-depth going through all the imagery in the throne room of God. I'm not gonna go through that again here, watch those videos. But the point of it is, the throne of God comes back down to earth and God calls out and tells the man with the linen to take the coals and to throw them down across Jerusalem, to throw them down across Israel. What are these coals? Now coals in the Bible were used to offer incense. They were used at the altars. They were used in the temple. It was part of the process of purification. And God's saying that between the cherubim, underneath his glorious throne, there are gonna be these, these hot burning coals of judgment and of purification. And God tells this man to take them and to throw them down across Israel. Why? Because he's going to make it rain fire from heaven. What is the purpose of the fire that will rain down from heaven in this chapter? It's to purify and to purge sin from the land and from the people. Fire has a way of burning up everything that's not pure, leaving only that which is most pure to remain. This is exactly what God is doing through his judgment. And this is why God calls for these fireless coals from the throne of God to be, from below the throne of God to be thrown down. Now, the reason that these coals are by the throne of God is because God is the purifying, all-consuming fire. And so God takes something from close below his throne, 
close to him and he throws it down and the purifying fire of God that's on these coals would lick Israel, would lick the people and it would purify the people on whom it lands. Unfortunately, there are some people that there is nothing precious and nothing in their character that can withstand the fires of God so they would perish. But for us believers, it's important to understand that as believers in Jesus, we can be saved even through the midst of the fire. We might suffer loss, but our souls will be saved on the day of redemption, on the day of judgment. Why? Because we have laid the foundation, which is Christ, that cannot be burned up. Everything that's built on Christ can stand this sort of judgment. But that which is built on this world will only burn in the flames of fire. Now, I'm saying all this because it's important to understand that this was physically speaking about fire falling from heaven and fire of judgment falling on Israel and burning up parts of Israel. But it's also prophetic language that we'll see mentioned in the book of Revelation and other prophecies about fire falling from heaven. And here we see the example of these hot fiery stones falling, these coals falling from heaven as a result of the judgment of God upon Israel. Thank you for watching and please do continue to watch in my channel, Jesus Doctrine. Please do like, helps me in the algorithms for YouTube. Comment again, ask your questions, put some comments. Most important, share this content, get it out to everyone that wants to understand this book. I'm deliberately going through a chapter every day or so to help people read it for themselves, to complement people's personal reading. I haven't got the time to go through every detail, but this is really as a study guide to help people for themselves to read, to understand. And once you've got the basics, you're going to pick it up for yourself and God and the Holy Spirit will help you. Please also subscribe. And if you haven't already, click on all notifications so that you're told every time I release a video because YouTube doesn't give people as many notifications anymore. Thank you guys for being a part of this. Like, comment and subscribe to Jesus Doctrine and be sure to watch that playlist to see all the new content on this series of the book of Ezekiel.